Hey, thanks so much for checking out the Nikhil Hogan Show. The show is available for free on multiple platforms such as most major podcast platforms, Facebook and YouTube. If you enjoy the content, please subscribe for the latest episodes and please like and share the content with others. Also, please check out NikhilHogan.com for updates on my upcoming book, Why Children Quit Music, and resources for more interesting music topics. Now, let's get to the show. On today's show, I'm so thrilled to talk to the amazing pianist, composer, and improviser, Charlie Albright. We get into his background, how he developed his fantastic skill from childhood, his training, his method to improvisation, composition, his exciting recent performances, and so much more. Stay tuned. You're listening to The Nikhil Hogan Show. Hello and welcome back to the Nikhil Hogan Show, the show where we talk to the world's best musicians and interview them and talk just about music. Today I'm so delighted to be able to talk to a really gifted, talented musician, the great Charlie Albright, hailed as among the most gifted musicians of his generation with a dazzling natural keyboard affinity who made quite an impression by the Washington Post. American pianist, composer, improviser Charlie Albright has been praised for his, quoted by the New York Times, jaw-dropping technique and virtuosity meshed with a distinctive musicality. An amazing career and he's really rising. He won the Ruhr Klavier Festival Young Artist Award presented by Mark andre Hamelin. He's collaborated with such huge names like Yo-Yo Ma, Joshua Bell, Bobby McFerrin. Charlie, great to have you on the show today. Oh, thanks for having me, Nikhil. I want to touch a little bit on the past, and I want to ask you, basically, did you ever, were you, did, did you go to the piano yourself? Did your parents ask you to take lessons? Was it something that you naturally wanted to do from the beginning? Well, yeah, so I, I, I don't really remember it, to be honest, because I was, I was three and a half, and uh, so the story goes... Uh, Neither my parents play the piano. Um, my I, I'm half Korean. My dad is from Ohio. My mom's from Korea. And, you know, in my mom's generation, everyone played a little bit of either piano or violin when they when they're growing up. So she played just enough that we had a very, very old kind of clunker junker upright garage sale piano like uh, in our in our living room. I mean, it was half the keys were probably missing. It was one of those type deals. And uh, I guess what happened was my mom was in the kitchen one day and I was I was about three and a half and climbed up on the bench. And I guess I started pecking out Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, the melody to it um, by ear. And so my mom said that, you know, she came out and said, you know, who who taught you that? And I said something like nobody or no one. (laughs) And so she saw that I kind of had a knack for the piano. And um, so, you know, she she taught me what she learned for a, a few months at the piano all by ear. And um, then I went to this uh, this little this little old lady who lived a block away who was she played the accordion, the organ and a little bit of piano. And so she taught me all these songs like, you know, the beer barrel polka and things like that when I was four. And then it, it kind of just it went from there. But yeah, my Wait, parents. Wait, hold on a second. Them... So Charlie, let me jump in here. Do you do you sure. have perfect pitch? I do. So are you good with your memory? You can hear something and you can play it back. I, I can't if I can um, if I can if I hear something and I know it well enough that uh, that I could sing it to you or hum it to you then I then I can play it on the piano and and improvise around it and stuff like that um, if, if I don't if, I might have to hear it a few times just to be able to get the tune in my head but if I can get to the point where I can sing it then uh, then I can play it did you play piano for pleasure as a kid growing up was it something you just played on your own nobody needed to tell you or did your mom ask you to practice so, uh, so my mom was probably the opposite of, uh, I remember a few years ago, they were talking about like helicopter moms exactly. and things like that, or tiger right. moms, that kind of thing. She's, she's probably the complete opposite of that. Like my parents growing up, I, I was very lucky. My parents growing up, they were always like, you know, um, do your, you know, you do your best, whatever it is that you do. You know what I mean? Uh, wh- whatever that is. And I remember growing up a few times, you know, we all hate practicing sometimes. I still do sometimes. Um, you know, I, I hate piano. I want to quit, you know, things like that. And, you know, I remember my mom saying, that's fine. You don't have to play. Um, you know, you should do something else then. You're not going to just sit and play video games all day, but you know, you don't have to do piano. And maybe it was reverse psychology. I don't know. But anyway, I always found myself <laughs> drawn back. <laughs> okay. So th- that's very good. You had a very relaxed environment. Now your teacher, you, you mentioned that, that lady across the street, how long was that training? And she, I assume she taught you how to read and she taught you uh, other things. Did, so you had a developed ear. Did she have to train your ear or was that something you naturally had on your own? 
Well, I, she would, what would happen is she, she actually did not teach me, teach me how to read. I didn't learn how to start reading music until I met my first like classical teacher, my first real teacher that I had for about 12 years, uh, Nancy Adsit when I was about seven or so. And, uh, so that, that neighborhood teacher and a few other teachers, uh, would all teach me completely by ear. So they'd play something and I'd play it back and we'd play together like a duet, um, one of my very influential teachers, um, shortly after working with the, the the older lady down the street, was a um, was a lady named Joanne who owned a piano and organ store at this really old kind of swap meet type mall place that they had in my town. I grew up in a in a, a small town called Centralia, Washington, in uh, about an hour and a half south of Seattle. And uh, she she would teach me. We'd, my dad would take me in. My parents would take me in sometimes. And she'd be she she would we'd, she'd play me a piece, and I'd play it back. And we one of us would be on the organ, and the other would be on the piano. And then we'd switch in the middle of the songs and run run to the other instrument and play that. You know, it, it was a lot of fun. And so I that was a huge part of my development. Wait, so how I had several you, teachers. That so you like learn that. you learn how to play the organ as well. <laughs> yeah, anything with keys, basically, I'd play. Organ, keyboard, you okay. know, the, the accompaniments you can do with those things. A lot of fun. Now, you said you began the formal training around 1996 with Nancy Adsit. Is that when you started to compose and improvise? When did you actually start to do those particular creative arts? I, I It's hard to nail down a time exactly because it was so intertwined. So, like, even when we were playing pieces by ear... A lot of it would be, you know, you'd be making things up and it wouldn't be anything that was written down. Nothing was concrete. You kind of go with the flow. And so I, it's hard for me to, to find a time where, you know, I just started, you know, improvising because I think it was always kind of underlying as, as part of what I had been doing since I touched the piano to begin with. Did you know, did you know what you were doing theoretically or did you, were you just going purely by what sounded good? And you were kind of mimicking and imitating models, songs that you liked and you enjoyed. I think it's, I think it's that. I, I wasn't, it was definitely not a, a theoretical, oh, I'm going to have to go to a four chord and then a five chord and then a minor three. You know, it was none of that at all. It's like, well, what, what works, right? And what sounds good? And if it doesn't sound good, then you don't do that so much. And if it does, then you do more of that, right? Um, and I, I think even to this day, uh, like when I improvise, you know, maybe in the classical style or, or whatever, or romantic style, or whatever. Um, it, it, it's not about, you know, what chords I'm going to or what form I'm going to take. It's, it's, it's almost like you have a big box of Legos. And that, that's kind of how I think of improvising for me, at least. Like, it's like I have a big box of Legos and they're all different sizes and all different colors. And you can, you know, let's say you want to build a spaceship, right? You can put them together in all kinds of different ways to build a spaceship, but you don't necessarily take a pair of scissors or a knife out and start cutting the, the Legos into different pieces or painting them different colors. You use little building blocks and you can use that to make something something bigger, right? So it was kind of like that. And now, just to get a sense of the kind of music that you listen to in your house when you're growing up, I assume it was pretty eclectic, right? Because you do like, you're known as a classical pianist, but you really collaborate in many different styles. I mean, you can play in pretty much all settings. Yeah, it's um, I, we listened to a whole bunch of stuff, and I still do. So I remember growing up, we'd always have like uh, the classical radio station. So in this area, it's it's King FM, they call it, and um, it was it was on like twenty four hours a day, it's super low. So like in the middle of the night, you know, in my room, I'd have the radio on like you know level four out of you know it was really low, you could barely hear it, but you know it would just be on, and it was it was comforting for me. But at the same time, we'd listen to a ton of jazz. We'd listen to uh, literally everything. I I, I grew, grew up with K-pop. I, I love K-pop before <laughs> it was like popular. You know, I was like, <laughs> I'm that guy now. <laughs> I, I remember when it wasn't cool. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, so that's that's really interesting. So you actually listen to many different styles. Uh, can you name? Oh, absolutely. Can you name a couple of things that really were influential to you? Like a couple of albums that are very special to you, or well, artists. One, one, Absolutely. So when I when I was growing up, um, when I was young, like a young kid, before I was really, you know, introduced to classical music and stuff, one of my uh, one of my favorite albums was Yanni Live at the Acropolis. If you remember that on PBS, um, it was you know I loved Yanni's music because you know it blended all these acoustic stuff with you know kind of pop but contemporary. I thought it was really really cool, and I still listen to him sometimes. Uh, 
and then growing up, of course, um, you know, Korean pop was big. And back when I was younger, it was like H.O.T., the group, and there was a few <laughs> others. I don't know. <laughs> and, um, you know, so I grew up on, with that side, maybe connect with my Korean half. I don't know. And uh, and I always really loved m- movie music. So like Disney songs. Right. So I grew up in the era of like, you know, Aladdin and the Beauty and the Beast and Little Mermaid, the animated films and the music and those things are so you know, amazing, right? So I'd play a ton of that. And, you know, it was just all over the place, my tastes. Let's continue on into your training. So then you started classical training. Was it a bit of a shock for you to start having to read a lot coming from such a strong ear ear background? I don't remember it being so bad, but I think I'm sure it was hard for my teacher. So so I was so I was taken from several teachers by playing by ear basically. And for a while I was taking from this this jazz teacher uh, in Olympia, Washington. And he recommended he's told after studying with him for six months or a year or something, he said he told my parents, you know, Charlie needs a year of classical training to develop his technique. And then he can come back to the the what I call fun songs, right? You yep. know, jazz and <laughs> pop and all that, you know. And so that was the original plan. So he introduced us to Nancy Adsit, um, who who is like my grandmother. I mean, she's <laughs> she's completely family, you know. Um, she so the the plan was to work with her for a year and 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 leave or you know go back to the fun stuff, right? Because she was a very very you know classically trained classical teacher, and um, you know you play what's written down, you you know. And so she started me on reading music and I think it was, it must have been a, a crazy challenge for her to, to get this little, you know, seven or eight year old kid to sit down and stop playing whatever he wants and start playing what was written, you know, <laughs> <laughs> but she, uh, she, she taught it. What pieces would she assign to you? Would she give you technical exercises? What would she do to build your technique? Sure. So like. I remember for a, for a short while, I did like Cherney and, you know, things like that. Um, I did, you know, I, I I didn't necessarily like a lot of it. You know, I, I remember I played this one piece, um, this one really slow piece or something. And my dad and I used to joke around, you know, it sounds like a slow heart attack. You know, it's such a slow, <laughs> boring, classical piece of music. It's, uh, yeah, that, that was the term we used. This is like a slow heart attack. <laughs> but um you know, we she she would we we'd eventually you know move away from we didn't spend a tremendous time on scales and stuff. We we did some you know handle you know chair need that kind of thing, but um she's quickly started teaching me um within a, a few years I started doing the Chopin etudes which are you know exercises technically but they're also gorgeous pieces of music so that made the technique less you know gruesome I guess <laughs> more bearable. Did that start to, because you come from an ear background, did he shape your ideas of how melodic ideas and harmonic devices, did that, did that start to influence you creatively as well, being exposed to that and playing that? I think it must have, but probably subconsciously. I think I was too young to really realize that like, oh, I'm taking influences from Chopin or, you know, <laughs> Rachmaninoff or whatever. You know, I think you know, at that point, you're like, let's just play the piano. Um, <laughs> but... I, I think so, because, you know, now when I improvise, you know, Chopin was one of the best composers for the piano. He, you know, he almost exclusively composed for the piano. So that was his main thing. Um, you know, unlike some other, you know, composers that made great piano music, but they also did stuff for all instruments, right? Chopin was really a piano person. And um, I, I think it, uh, like when I listen to some of the stuff I come up with or, or, or play, um, I, I can kind of hear sometimes those, those that those sounds because I think he knew how to really you know use the piano to a very unique kind of level you know what I mean because that's what he did. You played organ, so do you have a background in like figured bass, third bass, or any of the, those theoretical things, or do you not really think about that kind of stuff? Oh my goodness, I didn't know what figured bass was until I went to like college. <laughs> <laughs> um, look, I, I intuitively knew what it was, but. But I didn't know, I didn't have the, I didn't know what it was in terms of, you know, like, what it was called and, you know, all those, those types of things. I did, so my, Mrs. Adsit taught me theory. I had to do theory. I hated it. Absolutely <laughs> hated it. Hated theory. And, um, you know, and then later on I had to, uh, later on I had to do, you know, more theory in, in college and conservatory and stuff. But, um, but yeah, I didn't know. Like when I, I remember when I took one of my one of my uh, entrance tests when I was applying for colleges and stuff. You know, I just 
I, I didn't know all that much about what it was called, but I could do a lot of it. You know what I mean? So that was good. <laughs> yeah. I feel uh, maybe some of the theories is a bit overblown sometimes. You know, it, it can kind of sets people down the wrong way. <laughs> so I feel like sometimes it's just... Oh my about, goodness. Don't so- get me started on theory. <laughs> <laughs> I think with theory for me, it's I, I think it's an important thing to learn um, through maybe, maybe an intermediate level. You know what I mean? Like, you know, you need to know scales and you need to know key signatures and you need to know, you know, some basic chord progressions. That's great. But once you get to like higher and higher and higher level analysis and stuff, all of the rules seem to kind of just fall apart. And I, I have a theory. I have a theory. But uh, <laughs> I have a theory as to why that's the case. And I think it's because, you know, music has always been music, right? Like way before anything was ever written down, like before notes were a thing, you know, people would sing and play instruments and stuff. And then people would hear it and they'd play it and they'd pass it to their children. And that kind of how was that's how it kind of passed down through generations. And, you know, theory was kind of an invention to kind of explain, explain music in a way, right? Like we invented theory to kind of make music more into a, an analytical science, if you will, whereas it's not really a science at all. So, you know what I mean? Music is itself and theory is there to try to explain what's happening. And I think once you get to super high levels, it, it, it often can't do that. Yeah, for you, the sound comes first and, and so much the analysis comes later. Would it be fair to say that? I think so. I think so, yes. Let me ask you this. Back when you had more spare time, uh, did, did you did you experiment <laughs> harmonically with, with music? Did you, did you, is that something you would sit down and try and play around and just organically or, and just mess around with it? I don't know if I sat down with the explicit purpose of doing that, but I think that, you know, sometimes you'll, you'll get in the mood. It's like, oh, I feel like playing something, you know, and you're like, making something. So you'll sit down, you'll just play, you know, by yourself or whatever, and you'll just, you know, sometimes I'll experiment with something and it kind of goes back to what I, I briefly touched on that, you know, for me, it's, you know, if it's, if it's good, then I'll try to remember it and then you can use it more and more in the future and incorporate into other future ones. And if it's bad, you know, it sounds like, you know, if it sounds like crap, then you just, you know, throw it out. And, um, I, I think also that you, you hear things, um, from, from other composers and, in you know, and, and in across all genres, you know, sometimes I'll hear something awesome by like Hans Zimmer. Oh, I, you know, oh, I'd be great to meet Hans Zimmer. You know, I love his music. Like you hear something great, and it's like, oh wow, that is that's that's really awesome. And then you can kind of like, you know, what did he do? Oh, he kind of did this. And then you can maybe put that in your toolbox that you can incorporate into other pieces, or you know, right. whether it's a, a, so. Do you do you do that? Do you do you take ideas from? pieces that you play and say, I like that. I might use that in my, one of my improvisations. Uh, Is that something that you would do? Like, is that, do you take licks, so to speak? I think, I think subconsciously, I think subconsciously I, I, I must, because, you know, like as as we were talking about earlier, you know, Chopin influence, you know, and some of the sounds that I come up with now are very kind of reminiscent of Chopin or very reminiscent of Rachmaninoff or something like that. So you're saying subconsciously, do you, you, it just happens. You think you have such a memory that from something you've played, you can recreate it in the moment. I think so. Can you think of a, a, of a specific instance where that's happened? So like maybe you take a piece by Rachmaninoff or Chopin, or there's some movement that you enjoyed that you might have cropped. Let's see. I don't know if there's any specific one, but like, for example, I, one time for a, as a uh, kind of a gag, I did a... Um, I, I did a huge, I did recorded myself doing, you know, a never ending Rachmaninoff improvisation, <laughs> you know, and I, 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 it was a long time ago. I, it was just kind of, it was funny because I noticed that like in Rachmaninoff's music, a lot of times, you know, he has big chords and they're all fancy and there's like 15 notes in each of them. But, you know, a lot of times his melodies and his things don't like to necessarily resolve very quickly. Like, you'll think it's almost, you know, his melody's almost done. He's going to go back to the main key again. But then he just swoops up and just keeps going even higher and higher (laughs) and higher. So I did that as an exaggeration. And um, it it was kind of funny. It was funny to me, at least, because like I would just go and just take what he did and just push it to the extreme. Like, like, it, it never resolves. It's like... In Korean, you say it's tap tap It's like you know, it's 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 
what's the word? Uh, it's like it makes you anxious because you just want the thing to like, ah, you know. <laughs> well, that's that's so interesting that you are able. You can can you kind of imitate composers' sounds, and you could say, okay, let's let's do a little bit of Mozart, and and then you think oh, of certain yeah. elements that way. <laughs> In a way, that you, that's kind of absolutely. a fun kind of uh, pastiche of a, of, a, of a composer. Oh, absolutely! Yeah, you can. You know, composers have oftentimes have a sound, right? You know, what is what's Hans Zimmer's sound? It's big, huge, epic, you know, music. Like, it's not all like that, but a lot of it is, right? Um, what's Mozart's sound? Well, he has lots of little scales that run up and down and little broken, cor- you know, broken arpeggiated chords and, you know, things like that. What's uh, Chopin's sound? Well, he has all these five, seven chords and he does all kinds of like runs and, you know, uh, Rachmaninoff, the melodies never end. It never resolves <laughs> or it does, but it takes a long time, you know? Um, I think you can totally do that. It's a lot of fun to do. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's talk about your training then. So you graduated uh, with a BA from Harvard, and then you went to do your master's in New England Conservatory. What training at those institutions, can you talk about how it influenced you and what you got out of that, the training that you received? Absolutely. So that was uh, those were part of a, a joint program that I did. So it was really cool. They, in the, here here in the, in the U.S., they started it. I guess now it must have been probably 20 years ago now or something in some schools um, where they'll they'll team up an academic school with a music school um, and often they'll offer some kind of a dual degree, dual degree program. So, for example, Harvard's was you can get a bachelor's degree in anything you want. Um, at the same time, you can get a master's degree in music um, from the New England Conservatory. So. And, and, and also the cool thing about it is that it's faster than normal. So usually it would take four years for your bachelor's and then another two years for the master's. But during your first four years at Harvard, you're full time there, but you're also doing your first year equivalent of your master's degree at the conservatory. So then you graduate after four years and then you have one more year at the conservatory only, which is technically year two of that. So it saves a year, which is nice. And um, <laughs> the neat thing is you the whole time you're taking um, – piano lessons for me uh, or whatever instrument you're taking at the conservatory. Um, and I had a, uh, I had, I had a phenomenal, amazing teacher, uh, Hwa Gyeong Pyeon, um, at, at the, at New England conservatory. And, you know, she, she was amazing. Uh, Mrs. Atsit was amazing too. And she, she, you know, she brought me all the way up, you know, to time to go to college. And, uh, I, I met Miss Pyun there, and it was was that fantastic. Charlie was was that teacher polishing your technique? Or what did she do that developed you? I mean, a little bit of everything, I think, or a lot of everything. Um, she, you know, having I think in music, oftentimes like having a different perspective um, can be really really good. Whether that's even just going to have a you know an occasional lesson with another teacher, going to a master lesson or something. Sometimes two people can even say the exact same thing in different ways and one other way might click a little bit better or might make you think about something a little better, even though the two teachers are trying to get at the same thing in different in different ways. You know what I mean? And um, so, you know, when I when I went to to to, to conservatory, you know, you know, we worked on everything from, you know, musicality to to, to technique and really polishing that up and, and, and interpretation and you know, the whole shebang. Classical improvisation is not common. I would go as far to say as it doesn't happen. Well, how did your colleagues and peers react to you changing notes, coming up with stuff? Can you talk about like your teachers' reactions, your peers' reactions, and now your colleagues' reactions? Oh man. Um that's a good question. Um, so I, during my four years at, at Harvard, I was living full time in the dorms there, and um, so I had the the neat thing about the the you kind of you you kind of asked a bit earlier what I thought of the program and stuff. I, one of the great things about programs like that, I think, is that you can keep doing the music, but you can also be exposed to so much other things and so many other people that have completely different passions from you. You know what I mean? So, you know, I'd have dinner with people who were physics majors and people who were probably going to be the next president, you know, that (laughs) kind of a thing. And they were really passionate about their, their individual things. And so for me, you know, I was kind of like the, you know, I was the guy who played the piano, you know, that was kind of my passion, you know? Um, and, uh, you know, so every I think everyone there really respected each other and their their own you know passions, I guess you know, and their own interests and and uh, I think everyone was really supportive of each other. Absolutely, you had a positive reaction. That's great. So since you've been trained both 
to really interpret a score very well and also to improvise, how much time do you spend on, on each element of it? So how much time do you vote to sh- perfecting a piece of music versus working on your improvisation? Because you do both in a concert. Yes, yes. Um, in terms of daily practice time, it's heavily skewed to working on the polishing and interpreting and stuff other people's works. Um, the great thing about improv is that, um, you know, while you're doing it, well, the great thing and the hard thing, I guess, is that, you know, there's no take backs, right? It's not a it's not an essay you write down that you can, you know, go over a few times and work out the kinks. So regardless of what you, what you do, you know, what you practice at home, it's not going to be exactly the same there. And and it shouldn't be, you know. So, um, you know, basically at home, it's it's when you're when you're playing around, it's it's basically just adding to that toolbox, because ultimately, you may, you know, you might practice a spaceship at home, but you might want to build a house on your concert. You know what I mean? So it's not going to be directly translational. It's it's I think a lot of it's about learning about the different, you know, little Lego pieces, if you will, and just figuring out different new ways that work that you can put them together. Now, you did, you said you hated theory as a kid. Uh, but you yeah. probably had to do some of it in, in school as well, right? In, when you went to conservatory. Yes. So did you still have a similar feeling for it? Or did you uh, in, have it? Did you like it? Or was it still the same? <laughs> did I like you want an honest answer? Yeah, please. I, I we didn't want the really truth. like it all that much. <laughs> I did it because I had to, but I didn't really like it. You know, I was like, let's just get this out of the way, just get it over with. <laughs> um, did you feel it applied much to the way you improvise or compose? Did it assist you? Because I do want to ask you about how you compose. So, um, did it influence you in any positive way, negative way? What's your? How did that harmony and that counterpoint, and how did that really? have any effect on you basically um it, it probably did but probably more subconsciously again um it you know when i when i when i improvise and stuff I, again i don't really think about you know too much about the chords and things like that you know sometimes uh, i, I might have picked up certain things that that work well it's like oh let's you know like contrary motion in in theory right like you know the top's going up and the bottom's going down I'm, you know, I do that sometimes maybe when I improvise and where did I get that? Maybe it was from a theory class at some point. I I don't know. (laughs) (laughs) You know what I mean? But, you know, it works. Right. But, you know, like, oh, no parallel octaves, you know, well, screw that. I'm going to do parallel octaves (laughs) if it sounds good. I want to. (laughs) My piece. Now, you're a composer. So when did you start seriously composing? Well, I... I do the I, the main part of what I do is is improvising, and I'll try to make an improvisation sound as close to a polished piece as possible. And because I, I suck at like typing in in Sibelius and whatever, <laughs> I just don't have time. I'm bad at it. I'm slow at it. Um, so what happens is when I have a really good piece that I think that people might like, um, I. I, there's someone I know who I, I send like a recording to and then she'll transcribe it down for me. And then I can, you know, because I, uh, I am just bad at typing in notes one at a time. You've worked with really some of the biggest names in music. For instance, Yo-Yo Ma, you're a frequent collaborator with Yo-Yo Ma. Can you talk about the first time you worked with him? It, it says that you worked with him uh, for the very first time. I think it was 2008, was that right? On December 1st, when you're presenting right, yeah. when you're at a Harvard ceremony. Uh, can you talk about that experience and um, and how that launched off your relationship with him? Oh man. So I remember one morning I was in my, in my dorm and, you know, my roommates were next door there and, and I woke up and I, you know, checked my email and getting the day started. And I got an email from, from the director of the office of the arts at Harvard. And I don't think I had, I had met him before at that point. And anyways, the, the email was, you know, Charlie, there's going to be a, we're going to, Harvard's going to be giving this honorary doctorate degree to, to Ted Kennedy. Um, and this was like only the third time I think in history that Harvard had a special ceremony to give an, an honorary degree. And I think the reason was because he was, he was in poor health. Usually they're given at, at graduation time. And, um, and he said, we're going to have this, there's going to be this ceremony. And, uh, I, I'd like to know if you'd be willing and able to to, to play with, with Yo-Yo Ma for this ceremony. And, you know, my jaw just kind of dropped on the floor. I'm like, <laughs> <Right>. what? <laughs> I was like, so 
obviously the answer is yes. <laughs> and, um, and so, you know, it, it happened. And, um, and that's right when you're in college, right? Or you, were you doing your master's or were you an undergraduate at that time? I was an undergraduate still. And, um, and you know, I was, it was, I was just mind blown. And so we, we played, I think we played a Gershwin or a two Gershwin preludes or something. And then like the theme from the Gabriel's Oboe by Morricone. Did you have a rehearsal? And, and if, if so, what was that like? And how was it? Sure, sure. So I think that first time, one of the rehearsals, and I think it might've been the first time I met him was, was at his house. And so one of the people that worked in his office picked me up and uh, drove me to his home. And, you know, I was probably shaking. I, I don't know <laughs> if I was, but, you know, I was nervous inside. And, uh, but he's, he, you know, Yo-Yo Ma is the most, like, warm, welcoming, you know, kind-hearted person ever. And so he immediately made, you know, you feel welcome. And, you know, like when you're playing with him, you know, he just, it's just, it's just like this dialogue between the instruments. You know what I mean? Like he just, he, he plays off of you and you play off of him. And, it's it's surreal. It's amazing. Did he know at that time that you could you could improvise or 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 or, or compose? Did he learn that later as your star started to rise? I I don't know if he knew it at the first at the the first time we played because we were playing stuff that was was written down. I I think I was improvising a bit on the Morricone. I was adding notes and stuff that then was written on that page just because I thought it sounded better. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, the, the the melody of that piece is just you know absolutely gorgeous. It's 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 something it's something else. And um, you know we're playing in a very big hall, and uh, you know the piece I think originally was not composed for piano and and, and cello. It was it was transcription. It, it's a, I think so. It's a, I think it's for for orchestra actually for the the you know the accompaniment basically. So I I decided you know I tried to make it sound more like like that um you probably received the score did you think to yourself i want to change a couple of things here uh i don't know if i thought that or what or if i if i kind of started doing that during like rehearsing or something but um but yeah yeah, yeah. The, the, the the you know it's just little things you know like the you know how many where where the notes are maybe how many notes you put in a chord or something like just to make it sound richer because again i think it was a it was a transcription anyway it wasn't the original by by the composer so i thought well i can you know, maybe I can make it sound more like the original. Right. Now, did you can you share an, a Yo-Yo Ma anecdote of your time working with him? Anything interesting? And what did, I'm so curious what he thinks of your musicianship. It's like he's, you know, he has a he has a way of um, just making everything sound. Or he he's he's such a genuine person, right? That what what he says, even when he's you know making a suggestion or something, it's so you know complimentary. It, it, he's just, he's just great. Um, I remember, I remember minutes before we were about to walk on stage, we, I think I had just met Ted Kennedy backstage and we were about to walk out. I think, I think this, this was Joe Biden was there and it was right before he became vice president and I got to meet him afterward. That was cool. I was walking, we were about to walk on stage and we were like joking. It was just joking and shooting the breeze about like iPhones or something or what new features should be on. You know, it's just like, like and then we walk out and play on it. <laughs> <laughs> Does, it last. I want to ask you, concert pianists have a, an incredible pressure. They have to memorize so much. They have to play so much. And then the critics, they have to worry about uh, wrong notes, interpretation, tempo. And you can never satisfy critics sometimes, it almost appears. But... Do you get nervous when you play or you just don't care? And what do you think about, does it ever, because I read a Horowitz biography and the guy, they had to push him onto stage. And he was one of the greatest pianists of all time. What is your personality type? What's your temperament? Yeah, I'd just like to know about that. Well, I mean, to say that I never get nervous is, is untrue. You know, there are times when I get nervous um, and it, it depends. There's, you know, overall, I think it's, I'm getting better about not getting nervous and, uh, Sometimes it happens though. If you're giving a a big concert, I uh, if you're giving a really big concert somewhere you've never played or some big venue that you've never played or even a big venue that you have played, um, you know you sometimes get nervous and you know you're you're scared of critics, you know. But you're absolutely right. You can't. I, I've 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 kind of realized. I'm still trying to realize, but I'm realizing more and more. You can't please everyone with your music, and I think if you do, it's almost like you. If even if if even if you don't offend someone with the way you play, or you know everyone is like okay, that's fine. Maybe you haven't said something worth saying through it. You know, maybe you haven't 
you know? And so when I, you know, obviously you want to get great reviews. That's, that's, you know, who doesn't want to hear nice things about themselves, right? <laughs> but, but, um, at this point I try to be like, well, you know what, no matter how, uh, let, me, let me give you a fun example. One time I was at a competition. Uh, I can't remember where it was, but it was some international competition. And this, this is kind of the time where I, one time at least I attribute to kind of being the point at which I said, you know what, I'm going to do things the way I want to do it. Um, I gave a, I was, I performed in a competition. I was playing the Chopin Etudes Opus 25 or something. And I, I was eliminated after this one round. And so afterwards you get to talk to the judges and one judge a few minutes after or later in the day or whatever it was, you know, they said, you know, Charlie, the, the winter wind Etude number 11, right? That's, um, it was somebody, somebody, they go, you know, Charlie, you have to remember that the winter wind etude, it's a military march and it ought to be played that way. You know, they're like, it, it has to be like a military march <laughs> has to be, you know, very militaristic sounding. And I was like, okay. Or something along those lines. So I said, okay, okay. A few minutes later, another judge, same performance he's talking about. He independently came up, you know, he was, he auto, he talked about that same piece, the same number 11. And he goes, Charlie, it's not a military march. It <laughs> ought not be played that oh, way. You should And, you know, and that was within a few minutes of it. And it was, I remember thinking to myself, well, you know what? You can't <laughs> please everyone. So I'm going to do it the way I think it should be done. If people like it, great. I hope they do. If they don't, well, you know what? They can do it their own way then. <laughs> so I, I think if, I think, you know, you try to be, so, so after that, I kind of, or that's kind of the point I attribute it to, I, I kind of decide that, you know, I want to play things the way I think it should be played. Because no matter how you do it, there are going to be people that like it and there are going to pe be people who don't. And so at least this way, I can hopefully be convincing. And, you know, maybe then even people who say, well, I don't think it should be done that way, they might say, even though that's the case, I still found his interpretation to be convincing, even though I don't personally agree with it. Who are your, uh, now you've been like at the 2014 at Clavier Festival Young Artists Scholarship, you were presented the award by Mark andre Hamlin, who is known as the quote unquote super virtuoso. What was that like? Did you get to talk to him and uh, did he comment on your playing and uh, do you have a relationship with him? So I, he wasn't at the, the, the concert that I gave there, but Here's the funny story. I was sitting in a restaurant um, with with my now wife. Um, she she was my girlfriend at that point, and uh, Stella. And we were sitting in a I think it was a little Japanese restaurant in the neighborhood or something. We 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 were like we're just going out to have something to eat, and I get a phone call from like this unknown number, and I answer it, and it's him calling from <laughs> Australia. I'm like, wait, who is this? <laughs> so. He had chosen me for the uh, this award, but um, I don't think I, I so, so I, I was I was stunned and blown away. But um, I, I, I didn't I didn't actually meet him in person there for that award. Um, but he was he chose me for the award quite randomly, I think, um, or at least it wasn't like I applied for it, that is. So it was a random phone call that is. And uh, I was sitting there and I was like, wow, <laughs> so that's how it <laughs> what happened. Did, do you remember what he said? He must have said some things about explaining why he chose you, right? I I, I don't even remember. I think I was just so like <laughs> stunned from, you know, getting this random phone call. I, I, after, you know, like, again, picking my job off the ground, <laughs> he, I remember him saying something about this award and probably that someone would be contacting me about it. But he wanted to let me know that. I want. That's pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> now, you replaced at the Burgeon International Festival. You, uh, Lang Lang, canceled an appearance and you were at the last minute asked to perform. Is that right? At the Grieg Hall in Bergen, Norway? That's right. Now, um, so can, that, that, that sounds pretty wild. So, can you talk about that? Oh, yeah. So, that was in 2017. Um, so, that was two years ago, almost exactly two years ago. So, I, I, uh, I, uh, so they, they, I, uh, Long Long had had a, um, uh, uh, an injury. So he had canceled a few of his performances around the world. And, um, I got a, I got a call about them wanting me to come in and, uh, give a, a concert in his stead. And this was just, I think it was a few weeks before the concert date or something. And, you know, so 
I, I said, sure, sure. I had, you know, a piece, pieces that I can play and it was a solo concert. So it's flexible in terms of what I can play. And so I went over there and it was, it was phenomenal. I think like five or six encores and <laughs> yeah. they, they had like this giant poster of my face, like three stories <laughs> high on the side of the hall. It was, it was, it was fun. And then, uh, I, I just came back actually again from Bergen. Um, I gave two concerts a few weeks ago and um it, it's it's a beautiful place and the, and the people there love music and it's, you returned it's, it's, it's a, it's a, in fact not too long ago may this yes, this year yes. and you you Absolutely. and again the, with the encores they loved it and um <laughs> <laughs> you have a it connection a with, with with virgin no doubt now let's talk about greek then does that resonate with you that style mm -hmm. his com his uh, style of music his compositions oh, i love greek i love greek i think his concerto was like the second one i ever learned And um, so every year at the festival, they have uh, they play it because he's from Bergen, Norway, or at least he's lived there a tremendous a long time. And, uh, you know, they have a statue. They even have Greek branded bottled water and Greek <laughs> chocolates. I mean, it's all over the place. And uh, so a every year at the festival, they ha they play the Greek concerto uh, at Greek Hall with the Bergen Phil. And uh, this time I was I was asked to do the honors. So it was a lot of fun. So we went out there and. Uh, And killed it. <laughs> Now let's talk about concertos, cadenzas. Now you improvise, but not many, I mean, classical pianists typically, they will memorize a great cadenza from a, another composer or from the written down composer. Um, what's your stance on cadenzas? Oh, let's see. So I, I oftentimes improvise cadenzas, not always, but very often. Um, I... Uh, I, I think it's a lot of fun to do. Um, it's a chance that you get to really just kind of do whatever, whatever you want. So I've, you know, I've improvised, you know, cadenzas to Beethoven, to Grieg, to, to, to Vivian Fine. I, I, you know, and it's different styles. And you want to, for me, what I like to do is I like to, you want the cadenza to kind of fit in with the rest of the piece, right? You're playing a 30 minute long piece most of the time, and your cadenzas may be five, six, seven minutes, you know, at the end of the first movement or something. And you want it to be, or at least I want it to be, you know, I want to make sense in the grand scheme of the whole 30 minute piece, but also at the same time, I want to put my stamp on it, right? Because it's, it's like the, the cadenza is a, a solo part. It's a, it's a, it's a solo show off part, if you will. And um, so I try to, make that balance, I guess. Um, oh, so I don't take, want to take, all right, Charlie, yeah. take us through your mind then through a cadenza. The, the orchestra is setting you up. And so what happens in your mind? How do you structure it? Um, give an example. Like, so take, take sure. a concerto uh, that, you, that you play. And could you maybe perhaps walk through how you would kind of structure a cadenza and what's running through your mind at that moment? Sure, sure. So usually when I'm improvising a cadenza beforehand to prepare, um, I'll figure out what like themes from that movement I want it or, or maybe other movements I want to incorporate into the cadenza, right? Because you want it to kind of tie in with the rest of the piece that you just played. So I'll think, okay, the, he has, you know, this main, this main theme and then he has this other theme and then he has this other theme. So there's, let's say there's three things that I want to incorporate. Then I'll just play around with different ways of you know, linking them together and, you know, and uh, improvising around them, if you will, um, all at the same time while keeping in mind my time limit, if you will, you know what I mean? I can't sit there and just go off for 25 minutes by myself. That wouldn't <laughs> be, you know, you can't do that. So it's like, okay, I probably have maybe five, six, maybe seven minutes depending on the piece or so, give or take that I can improvise. So I'll have those main themes in mind and then just, you know, go through it, seeing what works and what doesn't until I have kind of a general framework. Okay, I'm going to start with this theme and I'm going to some, at some point go into this theme and then at some point go with this theme and then this is how I'm going to end so that the orchestra knows that they're supposed to come back in now, you know? And uh, it's, it's different every single time, but I have that kind of general framework. Oh, and it has to be five minutes long, that kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> now, you did your main stage Carnegie Hall debut. You selected the Vivian Fine Concerto for Piano and Orchestra. Now, Explain why you chose that and explain uh, how you prepared for it and uh, what what was your plan for your debut. So they, uh, the American Symphony um, is is headed by Maestro Leon Botstein, who is also the president of Bard, uh, Bard College in upstate, or not upstate, but north of New York City. And um, so he actually, so the, the, uh, the American Symphony Orchestra actually contacted me and they said, you know, Charlie, we're playing this. 
uh, this Vivian Fine concertante, which is it's a piece that Vivian Fine is an American composer, um, and and the piece is not really well known. It, it actually had never been performed in New York City before, and um, they asked me if I'd be if I'd be able to to play this and. Um, I hadn't played the piece before, so I learned it specifically for this for this concert, and it, it's a gorgeous piece. And uh, so we we did it, and it was it was fun. I improvised the cadenza to that one. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> and so it's also interesting too because you did an encore that was really fun. You did a Jerry Lee Lewis style encore, uh, "Great Balls of Fire." <laughs> now, now you I were on, hold on a second. You're in Carnegie Hall. And you're going out with a bang here. We we talked about being nervous earlier, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I was I was actually really nervous. That I was more nervous about that probably than the actual concert because <laughs> I I thought, you know, I, I had been doing I, I had been playing this Great Balls of Fire since I was literally four or five. It was one of the pieces that I think um I think Joanne at that at the who owned the piano and organ store had taught me that when I was a kid. And you know, I started, you know, I've always played it my whole life. And a few years ago, I started doing it, you know, as part of concerts sometimes. It's like an encore or something. I tell you, you've never seen so many screaming like 80-year-old women. I tell you. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so I thought, you know what? You know, I, I could play like a classical encore. I could do it. But everyone's done that. That you know, and what do I really want to play? I really want to play Great Balls of Fire. It probably <laughs> it might not have ever been played on the main stage of Carnegie before. I, <laughs> so I was I was debating and debating it and I was thinking, do I need to ask permission first? And I thought, <laughs> you know what? No, because it's easy to say no to something. You know, it, it, what's what, what's the saying? It's easier to get forgiveness than permission or something like that. And and uh backstage before I went on stage, I was upstairs next to my dressing room and there was this guy there who worked for Carnegie and we, you know, we really hit it off. We were just kind of talking and stuff and talking about all kinds of, he said he hadn't worked there long. He said, you know, and I, I told him my idea. I said, you know, I'm thinking of playing Great Balls of Fire as an encore, but I'm really nervous because it's, it's Carnegie Hall. I don't know if it's appropriate. Are they going to like, yeah. And he goes, do it, just do it. <laughs> and Turns out on the elevator right down when he was taking me to the stage, it turns out he's he's worked there for like decades and he's seen like every big famous historical like, you know, musician ever. He, he was lying about having only worked there a short time. <laughs> and anyway, I did it. And it was um, it was great. <laughs> That's fantastic. This is the fun part of the interview, at least for me, because I, I this is so I'm going to ask you hot seat questions top three this, top three that. It's, not, it's just for fun. You don't have to worry about what comes to mind immediately, okay? So I'm going right, to ask right. you, here we go. So I'm going to ask you, top three, top three, let's start with jazz, top three jazz musicians. Oh my goodness. I can't even name top three. I love, I love different, I, I can't even name top three. Like I'll <laughs> pick five. I mean like I, I, that song, my wife listens to that song so much. It's on like, I can't even name top three. Like I love. Like, oh, to, there is a name jazz musician. Three I don't think names like. that come to mind. Then right, right this minute. Oh shoot! I can't do it. I don't know. <laughs> can't pick. Three. Can't pick three. Love them all. <laughs> okay, uh, let's let's move on. So, how about um, top three classical composers before nineteen hundred? Top three only classical or yes. any kind of yeah. classical classical. Yeah. Okay. Um, top three: Beethoven, Chopin. Um. Oh shoot, Beethoven and Chopin are my favorites. Uh, Greek, maybe Greek. Greek. Top three etudes. Top three etudes. Opus twenty five, number one, seven, and twelve. So harp, uh, cello, and uh, ocean. If you could improvise with anyone in history, if you could jam with anyone, it could be Mozart, it could be B.B. King, who would it be? Oh, only one? Yeah. Why not top three, Nico? Uh, <laughs> <Come on. laughs> top three, everything else. All right, no, I, 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 I'll, I'll do top three. Let's do top three then. For his, um, everyone. How about, how about Chopin? Okay. How about Liberace? Okay. How about uh, List? list okay if you could ask okay let's take chopin if you okay. if you saw him if he, you could put him in a time machine and could meet him what would you mm -hmm. ask him would you have any questions for him i have any questions for him 
I don't know if I'd have any questions. I'd just be dumbfounded. I'd just be like, hey, let's hang out. (laughs) 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 You're cool. (laughs) All right. Top three composers after 1900. We're talking classical. Minotti. Okay. Uh, Janacek. Um, Kapustin. Okay. And name me your proudest musical moment. Oh, man. That's a tough one. My proudest musical moment. You know, I I don't know if I can name one. There's, I, I've been, I've really been, Nick, I've been really blessed to be able to do what I love. And there's been so many moments that I've been like, holy, you know, holy <laughs> smokes. This is, this is like, this is surreal. You know, like, like we talked earlier about the first time I got to play with Yo-Yo Ma. That was, that was unbelievable. I, I, there, there, the, the, the earlier this year when I got to play it at Carnegie Hall, I was just like, I, it was almost like a haze, like a dream. You know what I mean? It's like, you don't even really realize what you're, what you're doing. You know, you're going, you know, it's like you're going and playing. Yeah. But you don't really realize what's, what's happening. You know, that's actually pretty those good. Are, those are just, that's, yeah, that's, those are just two of two of them. But there's really, I mean, honestly, there's, I've been so blessed that there's, there's a lot that I'm really thankful for that I've been able to experience. It's, it's, yeah. Top three piano concertos. Top three piano concertos. Probably, oh shoot. Top three, no particular order. I love Tchaikovsky, Grieg, um, Shostakovich too. I'm going to keep going. <laughs> I love. <laughs> All right, give me f- two love, more, uh, five. Okay. Okay. Uh, Rhapsody in Blue. Okay. Let's, let's stick with four. Let's do that. Okay. Those are some. Those are probably my, my top four that I really, really like. Um, top three small piano pieces, like really small, quick pieces. Oh, um, I think, you know what's really fun to play is uh, the Volodos transcription of the Turkish March. That's the Mozart Turkish March. That's a fun, quick encore thing. Um, Schumann Liszt Wiedmung. That's a beautiful piece. And if we're not talking classical, I love doing things like, you know, I'm a great balls of fire, of course, but like if you're talking about more, you know, Amazing Grace, uh, Somewhere Over the Rainbow, I love doing versions of those. Do you uh, do you know Velodos? Do you do you know all? Do you know many of your peers in the concert pianist stage? Do you know a lot of them? That's that's a good. So I don't know Volodos. Um, to, to answer the rest of your question, the thing about piano I found is that it's it's probably the most independent solo of instruments that there is, right? Like. There's like three types of piano related concerts that you do. You do, you might do a solo recital where you're by yourself, or you'll do a concerto with an orchestra. So you're the soloist with an orchestra. And oftentimes, you know, you're, you just fly in or something, you'll rehearse a couple times, but you don't really get to know the hundred people you're playing with. And then there's like chamber music stuff where you're playing with maybe one, two, three, four other people. And you might get to know them a little bit better, but, um, you know, oftentimes, you know, you it, it's such a solo independent instrument. You practice most of the time by yourself and you travel a lot of the time by yourself that, you know, I, I knew a lot of people or I met a lot of people, you know, when I was in call at NEC and at Juilliard because, you know, you're interacting with musicians and stuff all the time. Um, but, you know, after that, I think a lot of pianists who who are, you know, career pianists, they, they travel and and perform so much alone that you don't necessarily run into people unless it's for uh, a, a festival where everyone's at one place at one time or something like that. Yeah. Now, who are your top? Do you know Lang Lang? You you replaced him in one concert, but did you ever get to? No, I've never met him. Okay. Never met him. I'd like to. Who are your top three classical pianists, like performers, concert pianists, and they could oh, be from history, any anything. Um, I'll give you some some really mod uh, the present day ones. Um. I really love uh, Marie Pariah's per- playing, um, Emmanuel Axe, Russell Sherman. Uh, my 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 former teacher, Miss Pyun's husband, is a concert pianist who's phenomenal. Yeah, those those are some Emmanuel present day. Axe, so I, when you got the Avery Fisher Career Grant, uh, he was part of the executive committee, right? I think so. I think he's part of it. You never meet directly the exec. Like you don't know you're in the running for the for that for that until you you pick. But um, I, I I'm I'm very lucky. I get I know I know I know Emmanuel Lax, and he's he's such a kind, wonderful person. <laughs> it, yeah, he, he he's 
yeah, he's great. Now um, we kind of ran out of time, and 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 it's just so fun to talk to you, Charlie. You're really you're really oh, yeah. a raconteur, so to speak. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I'm very much interested in classical improvisation, and and right. I think you know you do it so well. And can you give advice uh, if you could encourage it in the world? And and because a lot of pianists they learn their pieces, they play them, but I I I'd love if if more people were like you who could be creative, write their own cadences, improvise entire pieces on the spot. Can you maybe give some advice so that we can encourage more people like you, more people who do these things? And what advice can you give in that direction? I mean, I think I think improvisation is really, it's, it's really important. It's, it's kind of like, you know, like if music is like a coin or, a, you know, something, one side of the coin of music is, you know, playing things that other people have written and putting your own stamp on them, your own interpretation. But the other side is making up your own stuff. And I think if you don't, you know, it, I, I think it's really important to to make your own stuff because you can not only put your own interpretation on your own stuff, but you can also, uh, you know, you can also just create it. it it's like on, it's like boundless creativity, right? Like you can you can do anything you want. Whereas you know when you're playing another person's work, you can put an interpretation, but it's limited within the scope of like the notes and you know that they wrote and things. But on the other end, you can not only change the interpretation, but you can change the notes and the structure and the feel and and in a much bigger way than mes- maybe you can with someone else's piece, right? You don't play the you don't nobody ever puts an interpretation on the first movement of the Moonlight Sonata that makes people want to get up and start dancing. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> doing a jig. No, no. But you can do anything you want when you're making your own stuff. And I think it's it's you know, I think one of the best ways of practicing improvisation is just by doing it. Okay, so like a kid who admires you, he says, Man, Charlie Albright's great. I love that he can improvise. How can I do it, Charlie? Show me the way. Um, I think there's a few ways that I think can help. Um, number one, you got to just throw out inhibitions that it's going to sound like crap, right? Like at first, it probably will not sound good. If you've never improvised before, it probably won't sound great. But you can, you know, I think almost anyone can sit down and say, okay, I want to play a C major chord in the left hand. You know, most people who play the piano can get to that point. And I'm going to do a little melody in the right. Let's see if that can sound good. And you'll do that for a while and it'll sound lousy. But it's something. And then you say, okay, well, then maybe I'll add another chord. Well, what chord from C sounds good? Well, I can go to an F major. That sounds okay. Or a G major. Or, you know, do something. And then, uh, you know, make a little melody with that. And then go back and forth. You know, you kind of build off of it. Or if it sounds really bad, then, oh, I can't go from this to this weird looking chord. So I won't do that again because it doesn't sound good, right? Um, and I think that's a good way to kind of build. Another way is to basically make your own versions of songs that have already been written, but you don't have the scores to. So like, you know, if you like the, you know, the new Aladdin movie that came out and you know, you want to sing, you know, you like the, uh, I can show you the world song, right? Well, you know how the melody goes. So try picking it out by, with your right hand on the keyboard, right? Okay. So once you can get the melody down, well, what, what, what chord goes good with that? Oh, well, that, this one sounds good. And then how do I make it now sound like I'm not just playing blocks? Well, what if I break up the right hand a little bit and break that chord up, right? And you can kind of go on and on. And I think each time you do that and you find something that works, that's another Lego in your box that you can more – and the more you practice it and stuff, the more easily you can just say – when you're composing something or improvising something, oh, I need that red Lego. I need that one thing there and I can just stick it on and it'll work. And it becomes intuitive, kind of. Excellent advice. Fantastic advice. Uh, Charlie, do you have some projects you want to plug uh, for the rest of the second half of the year? Uh, let me think. Um, let's see. Uh, there's. Um, I, I just finished a whole bunch of concerts and I have a few weeks now. That, uh, next month, I think uh, I'm going to be in Newport, Rhode Island. So I'm going to be playing some chamber music and a solo concert. And uh, I'm also heading over to China. I'm going to be in uh, Qingdao, which I think is where they make Qingdao beer also. <laughs> so for all you beer lovers out there. Um, and I'm, uh, they're, they're starting this big uh, international music festival, the Qingdao Ocean Music Festival. And so they asked me to come and uh, perform with the orchestra in their opening opening concert, which should be a lot of fun. And, uh, yeah, those are some upcoming nearby things, but I think most of the rest of them is on my website. Can they go to your website and follow you on social media and you'll have all the updates? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so my website's just charliealbright.com and I have Facebook. 
youtube.com slash I think it's Charlie Albright Pianist. And I'm really pushing now. I'm trying to do more and more with YouTube. Um, and I'm even uh, one thing I started doing that's actually been a lot of fun because it gets me to sit down and actually practice <laughs> <laughs> is doing kind of live streamed practice sessions. We're all just like, you know, and people will be watching and they'll ask questions and I'll answer and I'll practice and you get to hear all the wrong notes and what everyone likes to hear. And uh, yeah, and an Instagram and all that good stuff. So, yeah. Well, Charlie, you're such a pleasure to talk to you. You're you're such a great musician and um, you're really a great model for people to follow. And thank you for coming on the show and talking to me. I hope you enjoyed the questions. I really loved talking to you and picking your brain. And I really hope you'll come back soon again. The great Charlie oh, Albright, thanks everyone. Thanks so much. <laughs> thank you, Nikhil. Thanks so much for listening to my interview with the amazing Charlie Albright. I love that he's a brilliant improviser and I really hope that a lot of young musicians will get inspired by the great things he's doing. I hope you guys enjoyed the interview. I have so many great guests that I've recorded that I can't wait to share with you. Please subscribe for the latest interviews and support the show on social media. I really appreciate it. Thanks again and I'll see you at the next show.